Hello, guys. Welcome back to the Dawoods 2 podcast. This is going to be the first ever virtual podcast. I have an exciting guest for you. He is the SGA president of Liberty. He is currently studying government, politics, and policy with minors in theology and biblical studies. Um, this is an exciting guy. It's his last year at school, but it's a good year. And he recently got engaged, which is exciting. I want to introduce you to Daniel Hostetler. Hey guys. Is that how you say it? Hostetter? Hostetter. Hostetter. I know some, ho- oh. some Hostetlers, some Hostetlers. We're all related. So. All right. Sounds go. good. So I'm excited to have you on. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, just, I'm sure you're quite busy with your role. Um, you have elections coming up uh, today and tomorrow, right, for SGA at Liberty. Um, just want to give me a little bit of background. So I knew you from Johnstown Christian School back in, <laughs> back in good old Pennsylvania. Um, my cousins went to that school. And you had a little journaling news Instagram page. <laughs> so that was like the first thing that I saw you do. Yep. Went from there. You got Liberty, SGA president now. What was the journey like from at JCS um, starting that little uh, news thing? And then now you're at Liberty doing great things. Yeah. Great deep dive, man. That's a, that's a deep cut. I haven't thought about the citizens brief in quite a while. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> so I guess I'll start there. Um, so actually funnily enough, when I was in like middle school, early high school, I thought I was going to be a sports broadcaster. I oh. love football. Um, I love talking about sports. And yeah. so that was my dream. Like, was, you know, to be Bob Costas or one of those guys on TV doing football, the Olympics. And then I realized like freshman, sophomore year, that's not terribly viable. There's not a ton of careers there, even though I loved it. I didn't really want to work every Sunday and do that every weekend for the rest of my life. Um, I'm really driven when it comes to career. I'm really driven by purpose um, and by finding like meaning and, and service opportunities in my work, especially in my vocation specifically. So I kind of backed up then about 10th grade and started to think more broadly about what I actually wanted to do and where my skill set was. Um, I knew I've always been passionate about leadership. I've been passionate about writing and I've been passionate about the truth and mm-hmm. politics really was at the intersection of, of all those things. Um, Mr. Crispin, my high school government teacher, who you may know, uh, was amazing. Uh, he taught me to ask really deep questions, to dive into great texts, and not just settle for a brief overview or a spark note, but really to dive in and ask the deep questions about the meaning of life, um, the purpose of work, um, purpose of me being on the, this earth. So um, sophomore year or so, I started really diving into that, um, especially coming up in the 2016 election. Um, and, and just after, that was when I really started to get interested in politics. Um, I think freshman or sophomore year, I started the Citizens Brief, which I could, funnily enough, like the subtitle of that was The Christian Perspective on Politics. Yeah. Now, looking back, well, uh, that's, you know, a little presumptuous to say The Christian Perspective, <laughs> but it was a great learning experience for me, man. Like, I learned, um, I pretty much wrote every single day. I, I dropped um, a couple of the top news items of the day, summarized some bigger issues. So... I learned a lot just by writing and writing and writing and writing practice makes makes perfect. So that was such a good experience for me. I'm sure my mom and like three other people read it, but it was a great experience. I still have published work that I can work off of. I published some of my papers in college. So that was a great experience when it came to writing, um, learning how to not just have opinions, but how to like make a logical argument and a case um, for the truth. Um, I think a lot of what motivates me in public life and leadership is so often our engagement now, especially in the digital age, is driven by um, just our opinions and by our hot takes and by our own truths. Um, but really what we need to recover, as Dallas Willard says, is kind of a renovation of, of knowledge. Um, that I believe in the Lord and God has one truth. Um, and that truth can be found in a lot of different places through general revelation. That's what scripture says. Um, and so I'm passionate about restoring knowledge and truth to our politics. So. I ended up going to Liberty, um, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but I ended up coming to Liberty um, mostly because of the government program and opportunities um, in the honors hall, which I love, would highly recommend if you come to Liberty anywhere else, living on some kind of honors housing if you can. Uh, it's been a great experience for me just to be around guys who are really driven to learn more about the Lord, are curious about life, and are a blast to be around. Um, and then I got involved in SGA my freshman year in the House of Representatives. Um, which then was the House of Delegates. We've made some changes since then. And um, loved my experience there, writing some legislation. I got asked to run for Speaker of the House by my sophomore year and of my freshman. Uh, no speaker had ever been a, less than a senior for years. Um, but the way things worked out, the Lord uh, had me serve in that position sophomore year and then decided to run for president um, the end of my sophomore year into my junior. So the first 
the election was pretty contested. The second one, not so much as, uh, but I've been in the position for two years now, which has been a blessing. Nice. Yeah. Um, I think going back to you talking about the, it was a citizen's brief, right? Yep. Um, the idea of working in silence to hone your craft is so huge. Like you said, like, oh, maybe only my mom and some friends read it. But you learn the skills that allowed you to do what you're doing now to be uh, running for that stuff so early in your career at college. I think it's a testament of like, you might not get all the glory and fame in the first few ventures that you go in, but it, God uses mm -hmm. it to prepare you for um, all the other stuff you have going on later on, which I think is exciting. I mean, yeah. I started my first, my first video I ever created was a three angle 10 second video of a tree. So I start somewhere. Right? <laughs> you gotta start somewhere. We started yeah. there. Um, so it's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to see how God uses certain things that were like, man, this sucked. I didn't get any exposure, but it honed yeah. your craft to move on. Isn't that and cool so, that it's, it's humbling yeah. in a way? Yeah. Um, and it reminds us who we are in the kingdom of God. I, yeah. I know it's humbled me because mm -hmm. the Lord elevates us in his timing, not in our own. Uh, it's, and I think what you said is, is, is not just true kind of in a, like a biblical sense, but it's also super practical. Like that's the way that our best work gets done. Um, I love the author Cal Newport. Uh, he's a computer science professor at an Ivy League school, and he writes a lot on the, the work of productivity. Um, mm -hmm. His newer book, Slow Productivity, I would highly recommend. Um, he tells a lot of stories of successful workers, knowledge workers throughout history who have succeeded in what they've done and produced such a high quality lasting product only because they spent like, in many cases, years honing their craft first. Yeah. or working on it in silence. Like think of Jane Austen, right? She worked on her manuscripts for years and years and years in a little cottage by the sea. And then in just a couple of years before she died, produced some of the greatest novels known to man. Yeah. Um, so there's so many examples of throughout history, think of Isaac Newton, um, even Jesus, right? For 30 years, he was doing ministry in private. Yeah. Um, and so often our best work gets done um, when we don't have a need for recognition. We're not just doing performative activity, but instead we're working on high quality work behind the scenes. Yeah, I don't, I don't think many people realize the fact that it's like, oh, Jesus did his thing, obviously, but he was like preparing for 30 years. It didn't happen until he was, I believe it was the age of like, you could be a rabbi, was that mm -hmm. 30, 32 or something? Um, and it was just God's timing. It's like, okay, you're ready now after you've trained, prepared, worked mm -hmm. in your craft as a, um, it was a carpenter, I believe, yeah. and. It, it's incredible to see that. And um, I think like the 10,000 hours of mastery, I think that's an interesting take and people don't realize how long it can take to get to the 10,000 hours. Yep. Um, and so, so I want to dive in a little bit more um, just into why you decided to get involved with SGA. So it started pretty early, freshman year, House of Representatives. What led you specifically to entering that role and then what led you to becoming the president and deciding to run and then choosing your your vice president for that role? I got in a little selfishly. I don't think that's a bad thing, but mm. I got involved freshman year because I was looking for government activities. I knew I probably wanted to be a staffer on the Hill at some point, have some government experience. So I hopped in an organization that I respected. I really loved and respected the president, vice president at that time, Constance and Joel from afar, and they have proved um, to be that much and more. Um, but I really joined because of them, um, because I trusted them and wanted to lead with them and learn from them, but also because I wanted a great resume opportunity. And I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Yeah. To, to Often the Lord uses those, not selfish, but like just simple motives for his glory and to transform yeah. our motives, which I've seen in my own life. Uh, so that's really why I got involved freshman year. And once I started writing legislation to improve our student body and experience, um, I got hooked. I like couldn't leave. Uh, it was contentious at times. That's how student government is. When you put two, 300 very opinionated students in one room, chaos can happen. But that's also where beauty can yeah. happen. So yeah. I, I love my time in the house. Um, but I knew that I think my story in leadership in SGA has really been one from like a passion for politics uh, evolving into a passion for leadership. I've realized like it isn't really politics proper that I'm called to, but really mm -hmm. leadership, managing a team, um, stewarding what the Lord has, has given me in a public sense for his glory. So that kind of change started to happen in my positions um, from freshman to sophomore year, ran a contested race for Speaker of the House, had to learn how to 
speak confidently, how to distinguish myself from opponents in a winsome and loving way. Because campaigning is hard, man. Like as, as a believer, I find it really, really hard to campaign and try to like push against opponents, um, yeah, especially yeah, fellow believers them. and even friends. Yeah. Uh, but I learned so much from learning how to do that in a caring and loving way. Like when we compete well, whether it's in sports and politics and anything else for the glory of God, and we're actually doing it to love others, not just in, the, in love and name only, uh, then we're doing what John tells us to do in first John, which is to love others and through loving others, we're loving more. So that competition was really, really good for me. Um, that sophomore year, about partway through the year, I started talking with my club's director, um, Riley, who worked in the executive branch. She was also a sophomore and we both realized that the Lord had given us a pretty strong vision, um, for the future of the university. Uh, university leadership was very much in flux at the point. We were under an interim president after the pretty public downfall of Jerry Falwell Jr. Um, just days before my freshman year started. Um, so up to that point, I had only known Liberty University really in flux. I had a heart for what I wanted this place to look like years down the road. I saw a lot of opportunities for change, but also continuing what we were doing well and publicly lauding that. Um, it, at the time, the university was facing a lot of heat in the media, and I wanted to be able to help hold the university to account, um, which I have had to do at times, but at the same time, um, be able to defend our university publicly when it's come down to it. Um, so we ran that year. I learned a lot from running a campaign. It takes a ton of man hours. I had dozens and dozens of people um, campaigning for me each day that season. Um, and so that was when I first learned how to manage a team. It was tough, but uh, really rewarding in a lot of ways. As the leader, uh, especially in something like student government and on, and on a campaign that's so enthusiasm and momentum driven, a, a lot of my job isn't even just like organization of details. A lot of it was that, but really my most important job on those two campaigns was really being the driver of culture and of passion and of energy. Um, because even if we had the best organized campaign, we weren't going to win and be able to serve the student body if we didn't have a ton of energy um, from the get go. So. As an extrovert, that works pretty well for me. I'm happy to be at the table, hyping people up, um, making sure that the fire keeps going in the campaign and we're surrounded by a vision. Um, and that's actually, that's probably another really important part of campaigning and just of leadership in general. Um, I think it's easy to sometimes lead with our personality. And of course, again, that's part of it. Charisma is important. But if we don't have a vision, the people perish. That's what scripture says. I think that's applicable to a lot of contexts, especially whether it's leading a business or leading government. Um, without a clear and passionate and attractive vision that everyone is circling around, including the leader himself, it's going to fade pretty quick, right? Like we see, I mean, throughout history, you've seen a lot of like messiahs, false messiahs pop up and no matter how charismatic they are, their vision always dies off because they don't really have a vision for the good life. They either have a lot of grievances or a lot of charisma. And I don't think that's going to last whether on a national political scale or even on my level. Yeah, I agree. I think the goal and the vision is the most important part. And it's how you can carry that goal or vision and yeah. whatever you're doing as a leader, whether it's a business and serving your audience, making sure that you mm -hmm. uh, give them the, uh, the resources you need or whatever product you're selling to someone. Um, but then as a leader in government or an organization, it's like, here's our mission. This is yeah. how we're going to do it. We need to fight for it. Uh, rally the troops. Um, that's interesting that you say that because um, so today campaigning just opened for class council at Cedarville. So yes, we have sir. SGA and then class council. Um, and so I been roped into the role I'm running for vice president, Congrats. sophomore class. So we're starting today. Um, and yeah, so we'll see how that goes, how campaigning is it's a little different than SGA. I wouldn't say it's as taxing, but it's still like you want to put in a good effort. Um, to yeah. say like, I'm not just going to like put it out there. I'm running. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, Congrats, I wanted to, brother. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll I see how it. it goes. Um, we have, uh, I think I'm the only guy running. So it'll be interesting just to see how it goes. There's uh, another girl you. running for vice president, two girls running for president. So I think mm -hmm. it's exciting. Um, we'll see how that pans out. Um, cause I have about a week after mm -hmm. Easter. But I wanted to dive into a little bit of a collaboration between Christian universities. This is okay. something I've thought about for a while, um, especially because I don't think it's as potent at Liberty. 
um, cause Cedarville is smaller. We have about 5,000 students. I, I really enjoy the size. I like that I can know almost everybody on campus. Um, but then there's Liberty Liberty's out. You guys are big school, which is good. Yeah. I think Christian should try to be big in things to try to compete at the highest level possible. Um, I think there's a need for that, but I've always been interested in the idea of should Christian colleges, specifically universities, try to collaborate, build each other up, work together in ways that even other universities might not um, just because we have one main goal. There's yeah. one overall goal, share the gospel with others, create community, disciple others. Um, besides the fact that, like, obviously, Liberty wants students, Cedarville students kind of pulling from similar uh, demographics when it comes to right. getting new students. But um, what are your thoughts when it comes to collaboration between Christian universities mm -hmm. and helping each other, building each other up, holding each other accountable? I think your question nails it on the head. Because we're Christian, we do things different than other universities. Um, in the past, I think Christian schools can sometimes abuse that phrase, right? Like we do things different, which just means we don't think, do things as well. But I think if we're doing things with excellence as Christian universities, then we should also pursue doing things pretty different, which looks like counteracting not just some of the destructive policies that we've seen in secular universities or ways of doing things, but um, also the spirit in which we interact with other universities. I think you're really right on that. And as universities, I've seen this modeled well at Liberty, but we have to walk this really fine line of um, having a healthy level of, of competition because it makes us better, right? Like that's the best part about our American capitalist system is when colleges are competing for the same group of students, in a way, it's a pretty large group, but still a very similar group, especially when, you know, Cedarville and Liberty aren't that far apart geographically. Um, I think that healthy competition can actually make us better because it forces us to innovate in order to keep gaining students. Yes, and it would yeah, force exactly. you to build innovate, which is great. So I think healthy competition is great as long as we're not acting in deceit or immorally. But the other side of that is you said it, like we have the same goal and same mission. At, at Liberty, we talk a lot about creating champions for Christ. And I know that's like a buzz phrase, but I, I really think it's actually pretty prescient. Um, Right now, we see so many Christian leaders failing morally. Um, we see a lot of people just with maybe a lot of skills and again, charisma, but really weak character. And I think like our voting has kind of reflected that even nationally and on state levels. So what better place for character formation to happen as well as career and professional skills than Christian universities, yeah. especially at places like Liberty and Cedarville. We have the, we have the skills, we got the money, we have the faculty, like all those things are incredibly important yeah. to being able to, to invest a lot of time and resources into forming our, our best and brightest leaders, just like you really well. Um, so what an awesome opportunity for Liberty, for Cedarville, for the rest of the Christian higher education community to not only pursue healthy competition, which I think we're doing, but also to pursue healthy collaboration. I, th I think nothing but good things can come of that. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I was talking to yeah. our, um, chair of interdisciplinary chair of interdisciplinary studies the other day and he was um about potentially pitching a new honors college that's something that's one of my passion projects we're hoping to get done at least pitching it to the provost office um, but when we we're talking to the chair of interdis about that he he told us about something called the enrollment cliff of 2025 which basically means that a lot of because of the financial crash of 2008 less people had children around them. So that means that there are far less college eligible college age children starting in 2025 for about the next 10 years. Um, so that means that enrollment is likely to drop off. Um, combine that with the factors of the coronavirus of 2020, um, how that has harmed the K-12 education. Combine those two things together, plus the digital age and how that's malformed our children. Like we've got a recipe for disaster. So. Again, what incredible opportunity for Christian colleges specifically to come together. Liberty's going to be fine. We have the money, we have the resources to actually grow through this challenge. But smaller Christian liberal arts colleges are really going to struggle to stay open unless they have a really good plan. So I know at Liberty and elsewhere, we're really talking about what it looks like to be able to protect and save and help grow some of the smaller, amazing, historic Christian liberal arts schools. Yeah. There's... I think the heart behind that is there's so much that they can add, right? It's not just like, oh, we're going to take your students. Like that's unhealthy competition, but healthy collaboration and mutual love for each other as Christian institutions who share the same mission and vision and goal. Um, 
really should be to come together and be like, hey, there is a role that each of these institutions plays in their local communities, but also in the broader national community, right? Like Cedarville might have a really good business or engineering program. Liberty might, you know, have a really good nursing program or, or engineering program, right? It's, it's going to look different um, yeah. depending on the place. So the more Christian institutions we have that are healthy and thriving, the better. Yeah, I agree. I think um, part of it's that's really interesting, just geography. Mm -hmm. um, besides the fact that Liberty cool. and Cedarville are definitely the East Coast um, or on this side of the country, um, there's a lot of the kids that still go to college in their home state. A lot of people, yeah. they want the extra funding. Uh, they want the extra scholarships, but also the ability to go home on the weekends. A lot of students still really value that. And so I think um, helping colleges in their geography to serve those kids that are in their area, I think yeah. is huge. Because that's something, that's the one thing that Liberty, that Cedarville, that uh, Grove City, Messiah, whatever, can't change. They can't serve yeah. Virginia students or Ohio students like they can serve Pennsylvania students if that college mm -hmm. is in Pennsylvania. So I think that's the one distinction that makes it um, really big for some of those smaller Christian schools compared to um, Liberty, Cedarville, um, Grand yeah. Canyon, whatever other colleges out there. And some people are looking for that experience. Like my sister goes to Asbury University uh, in Kentucky, which you might know from kind of the national outpouring revival that happened last year, which she was able to be a big part of. Uh, but she looked at Liberty pretty seriously, got some good scholarship offers, but ended up choosing Asbury because she was looking for a pretty small rural college. And it has been an incredible experience because she gets the kind of one-on-one -on -one relationships that I have to really work for at a big school like Liberty. So again, it really depends on the student. Um, to those watching this who are prospective students and thinking about what Christian college to go to, I think size is actually probably one of the most major factors because it really does impact your student experience. I chose Liberty because of the incredible opportunities I would get through being a big college, which has paid off for me in, in pretty significant ways. But I've also gotten a really good tight community. Um, but at a smaller college, you might not have as many opportunities, but you know you're going to have a really tight knit community. Um, and you're probably going to know everybody in campus, which can make your college experience really worth it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, that was definitely what I weighed when I was looking mm -hmm. at the different schools, because I believe that Liberty and Cedarville both had very good business programs for what I was looking for yeah. and that um, there would be good opportunities at Liberty. Um, and I think I believe Cedarville has provided some great opportunities as well. But uh, the drive for me, the ability to really reach a lot of people, it's a cool thing uh, and a different thing at smaller schools. Um, yeah, so it's very cool. I want to change gears a little bit now. Um, kind of, you mentioned it, just uh, community relationships. Whenever you were campaigning, running for SGA, you obviously had to choose your vice president. Yeah. Um, and then you said you have to work maybe a little bit harder sometimes for those personal connections at Liberty, it being so big. What helped you um, determine your running mate? <laughs> Not necessarily like, oh, I'm going to pick this random person. Just like, what do you look for in a person yeah. like that to help you mm -hmm. lead? Because um, Justin Powell talks about it a little bit. Um, he's a guy I had recently on my podcast, and he's in charge of Forge. He um, emphasizes community, for one, and then, two, having a council, having a personal right. council, a business council, an organization council, a group of people that can reflect, comment, and keep you accountable to your uh, personal life and then also your business life and in what you're doing. Um, what have you found helpful in determining the people that could be in your life and be close to you and just giving you guidance? Sure. On the community side, I think that's a good way to frame it, by the way, at community and council. I think a, a lot of times that overlaps, it helps yeah. when it does because uh, the people who know you best will be able to give you the best counsel. That's how it's yeah. been in my life. Uh, so coming to Liberty, I I remember being a little intimidated by the size of the school, but I prayed. I remember it was a really simple prayer. Uh, I just prayed, Lord, would you give me one best friend? And I walk into my room and I find my best friend. He's my roommate. Like he's still my best friend. We're still roommates four years later. Uh, he's the chief justice in SGA. So I work with him every day. It has been the friendship of a lifetime. Uh, but the other nine guys who I ended up being best friends with from pretty much like week two of freshman year, I still live with. Um, one of my best friends who I still live with from freshman year in my like community group that we met to discuss scripture freshman year, he's now my vice president. So nice. I think I've had a pretty unique experience in terms of community formation and how that's flowed into my work and into my council. Um, 
But when it came to picking um, vice presidents, so I actually ran with uh, Riley Foster, who was our club's director my sophomore year. Um, and that was a pretty strategic choice. I was great friends with her. I knew that we would work well together on like the governing side um, because she brought so many different perspectives and communities that I just simply didn't have. And I knew that her work styles would go pretty well together. Uh, and then we had a shared vision, which again is so important for being able to lead with someone for an extended period of time. But we also had electoral considerations. Uh, at a university this large, you very much have to think about demographics. And so I knew that it would be helpful to have a guy and a girl on the same ticket. That historically has been helpful. It, it, I knew it would help our leadership, but also our chances of getting elected. Um, and again, she came from a ton of different kinds of communities. So in the end, we ended up winning a close election. And I think that that choice was the right one. Um, and then last year, I ended up running with my chief of staff at the time, Braden Daniels, who I then chose as my vice president for my second term. Um, and that has been wonderful because we work so well together. Uh, I know they often say, don't work with your friends. And I think that is generally very good guidance. But I love working with Braden uh, because we've honed so much trust and love and sacrifice for each other over the last couple of years. We've been through so many crazy circumstances um, that I'd do anything for that man. So the kind of friendship trust that we have built has helped us lead together, which I think is a pretty good principle for leadership, uh, especially at the top of a pretty large organization like Liberty Student Government. We have two to 300 students in there every year. Uh, I'm basically act as the CEO of a pretty large organization, managing a team of 10 student workers every day. It's a lot. And so to be able to hand, handle the pressures of that, plus the things that we're learning from administration, I can't do it alone because it is a little lonely at the top. And that's true. My um, predecessors told me that, and I'm going to tell my, my successors that, like, you need to surround yourself not only with good counsel, like a solid vice president you can trust, who won't go behind your back, an amazing chief of staff who will get all the the smaller tasks and administrative things done so you don't have to worry about it and you can trust to not gossip or anything. But you also need really good friends around you, whether you're in leadership or not, but especially in leadership, in business or in government, um, to be able to encourage you when you're down, uh, but also to be able to counsel you when you're confused and call you out when you're insane. All three of those things have happened to me from my best friends and my fiance. Um, and so surrounding myself with that sort of community has honestly been probably sanctifying and growing in a professional sense more than anything else in my time as Liberty. I've learned a lot in my classes, a lot in my work, but the lessons and skills that I've learned from my friends and my, my counsel, my co-counsel in a lot of ways has been priceless. One yeah. for the world. Yeah. I think, um, you kind of hit the nail on the head, um, with friendship, but also with, uh, counsel of like the three things you need to take care of when you're down, when you're confused, when you need, guidance and things and then whenever you're um, kind of going off the track um, you need people who both in the workspace so you have your chief of staff you have the yeah. people around you but then outside of it too I think you need to have the separate two groups kind of um, 100 percent, <laughs> just to help you because um, sometimes you don't want to always talk business sometimes you're just like man this this sucks right now I need help <laughs> like yep. so I think it's very helpful and then you had a kind of good transition there um, you have SGA elections coming up. Yep. Um, you have some great candidates. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about them? How excited you are for this transition? Do you think uh, you have some great candidates coming up yeah. that could just continue to lead Liberty? And then maybe any advice, encouragement you have for them as they get uh, ready to possibly lead uh, this organization in the future? There are different leaders for different times. Yeah. Uh, I think my time was incredibly unique. I stepped into a situation where the few administrations before me on the SGA side had really done an incredible job of, of kind of holding the administration accountable when they needed it um, and were able to rebuild kind of some of the internal structures of SGA. So we were handed a, a growing institution, but one that was also in strife and, and trying to figure out how to respond to many of the administrative and contextual challenges of my time. Uh, so over the last two years, we've really tried to make SGA a much more like legitimate institution on the student side. So increased student respect. Um, but we've done that increased our perception by changing our culture, which our culture is totally different and way healthier than it was even partway through my first year when I think it was maybe at its worst. Um, just a lot of internal strife. But at this point, there's a ton of peace. There's a lot of people who are there for the right reasons, who are there to serve. So culture has turned around. So we get to hand our successors an awesome culture, which is such a gift that we didn't expect to be able to give. But we're also able to give them one really good relationships with our administrators. 
uh, namely President Costin and then my boss, Dr. Hine, who heads all of student affairs, who we meet with regularly. Uh, but also, I think much more reformed internal structures. Uh, when I entered the job, I was given, and not to the fault of my predecessors at all, but I was given a couple meetings of transition and then a couple documents, and that was about it. Um, there just wasn't much to, to give. Like, we really had to kind of make the job in a lot of ways for ourselves. So that was kind of a blessing in disguise, actually, in a lot of ways. Uh, we were able to look at the HR policies of a lot of different companies, um, totally revamp our job descriptions. We went from just a couple pages of transition documents to 70 plus pages for most of our position. We've totally revamped the transition process. So I'm stoked whoever wins out of Isaac uh, and Abby and Silas and Adam. Uh, the, the gift that we're going to be able to give them of a strong, healthy institution that has really solid procedures I think is the best thing we can do. Uh, and it's interesting. A lot of people think SGA is like a government simulation. It kind of is that. We have three government branches. You know, we're representing students, but it's more of like a union or a business. Um, we really run that way in a lot of ways. I run my team like a CEO's executive team, and it allows us to be really effective and efficient while also listening to and accurately representing students. So all that said, I think these um, four candidates on two tickets are excellent, and I think they'll be able to pick up the mantle. Um, Isaac, as our current communications director, um, has done a wonderful job totally transforming our perception to the student body on social media. And then Silas, the other presidential candidate, is our current Speaker of the House, so my last position, which is kind of fun. Um, and he's done, a, he's done a great job leading a kind of a newly reformed, in terms of structure, House of Representatives, who now can represent their halls much, much better. So I'm excited to see who wins, uh, whoever wins over the next month, really. In, in the past, we only had about a week between the election and the inauguration when I would leave office. But this year, I passed a constitutional amendment to change it to about four weeks. So we're going to hold a massive event in our office hosting 50 or 60 administrators from the president down um, to introduce them to our next leaders, to be able to get them to network and connect. And then we'll hold some strategic meetings over the next few weeks to be able to equip them with everything that they need to succeed and honestly do way better than we did. I know that's what our predecessors told us was, hey, like we love you, we care about you. We've, we've done a lot of what we've wanted to do, but now we want you to do better than us. And I think that should be the goal of the leader is one, to finish well, to not leave you know any string unraveled, like get it all done, lock it all down, be proud of what you did, have no regrets, but then hand it off freely. And just, I can't wait to step back and say, you lead. I'm not looking over your shoulder. I will be in Lynchburg next year, but I don't wanna be the president emeritus, right? Like I wanna leave it and say, this is your institution. Make what you will of it. The Lord is going to work through you because you're the leader for this time. And I'm not. So we all have limits. Um, I've had a lot of failures, a lot of successes too, but I've failed a lot in this position. Um, and there's some things I wish I would have done differently. But at the end of the day, I'm proud of this institution. I'm proud of what we've done with our limited time and uh, mental energy and, and strength. Um, and I think the next president will do the same. Yeah, I think that's the attitude. I think the best attitude a leader can have, business, government, Mm -hmm. um, is make it the best way, best as possible for the predecessor to then go and be better. Yeah. You should always wish on the next one to be better and that you can set them up in the best way possible to be better. Yeah. Um, I think I that think of Paul's words, like yeah. he says, like, Hey, like I'm just laying the foundation for the gospel yeah. and there'll be so many others who will build on top of it. And yet his legacy remains. Right. And so I think that's pretty cool, and that should be our heart as as humble gospel servants, yeah. even as leaders, right? It's so easy for pride to creep in, man. I'm sure you feel that. That's been a hard hard challenge for me, uh, especially when I'm doing well. But even when I'm doing well, like I need to rely on the Lord and say, like, I I trust you with the outcome. I trust you with my future, and I'm just going to serve. Yeah, yeah. Pride yeah. is a it's a scary thing because it's something that is noted in the Bible as something God like desperately hates. He hates all yeah. sin. But it's really emphasized, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, every person deals with different things. So uh, the people who are leading, maybe they tend towards pride more, and if you're in a position where you might deal with insecurities, that could be your uh, yeah. struggle. I want to kind of talk about uh, your outlook with Liberty. Um, so new president uh, recently, um, you had a town hall with them, and uh, I just want to hear your thoughts on what you think Liberty's going to do in the next few years, your outlook on its future, um, if you're excited for where the school's going, and just what you think about the new president and everything going on. 
Great question, man. This is a this is a good time to ask that question. I have never seen an institution going more in the right direction and going there faster than Liberty. Um, I love this place. Uh, obviously, the last four years have been rough in terms of uh, the fallout from Jerry Falwell Jr. Um, and the struggles that just come from stepping into new leadership um, and learning how to be a healthy institution again, because Liberty had to relearn that. Uh, we had to relearn what normal was like because we haven't had normal since 2008, right? So it has been really amazing for me to see an institution actually heal. Uh, I think that's what many in the media and public don't understand is that grace has transformed its place. And it's totally different than it was even like a year and a half ago uh, under our new leadership. So I love President Costin. Uh, the first day I was back here this year, he spent like four hours with us um, just getting to know Braden and I, and he has a heart of gold. He is the best leader I've ever met in my life, um, is so gracious and kind and generous with his time and is always everywhere all the time at every student event. But at the same time, he leads his organization so well. He's very disciplined, uh, runs all his meetings on Robert's rules, kind of with that military. He's, he was an Air Force general, um, so runs it with order and discipline, but always is down to approve new ideas. So he's been so good for SGA. I think he's the reason why this place is going in the right, the right direction. Uh, but from faculty to staff, like, man, we, we're stacked. We, we got it made. We got a lot of good people who are here for the right reasons. They don't care about how much they're getting paid. They're just here to work and serve. So I think Liberty is going in an incredible direction. Uh, we're growing our, our endowment by billions of dollars really at a time. Uh, in the next 10 years, we should have enough money to basically be able to support ourselves, uh, especially when it comes to financial aid. So I'm really proud of the financial decisions this university is making. It's not selfish. It really is unselfish and for the sake of the students. But I'm also proud of uh, some of the innovations that the university is making. Right now we're in like, so it's called, it's called a strategic planning process. Most universities and corporations do this every couple of years, but ours hadn't been renewed in several years. So they did a massive environmental scan of all the best practices of colleges and universities around the country, and then looked at our own culture and practices and said, what do we need to fix and what do we need to keep doing? So I'm excited for some of the new initiatives coming down the pipeline. The one I'm most excited about that I hope we can make happen is an honors college. Right now we just have an honors program but I would absolutely love to see our academic programs really taken to the next level. Um, I think in the future, schools like Liberty honestly can compete with the Ivies. Um, we've seen a lot of our best public universities and, and secular private universities fail in their missions in a lot of ways, get caught up in other extraneous things and not pursuing their mission of solid um, pursuit of knowledge, which really is the goal of education. Um, at least as Christians have understood it for millennia since Augustine and even up to Dorothy Sayers. So, I'm really stoked about the direction Liberty's going in. Uh, I think we're going to keep growing academically. We're, I, I pray that the direction we're going towards is like prestige and not just appearance of prestige, but like actual academic rigor, being able to yes. ask hard questions, getting the best scholars here. I think we're going in that direction. Um, what I don't want us to do is just to provide educate, like mass quantity of education. I think with our online school, that can be a temptation. And it's great. Like we want to get education to everyone, but that cannot come. And I think the university is going to be good about this. That cannot come at the expense of sacrificing the quality of our education. Um, so I'm proud of the work our university is doing. Um, I think it's, I think it's honestly a model right now in a lot of ways for other Christian universities. Um, but also it's been cool to see us learn from other, other places too. Um, whether it's Cedarville or Wheaton or Moody um, or even Charleston Southern, where our president came from. I think we have a lot to learn from what a lot of smaller Christian universities are already doing well. Yeah, I think uh, touching on the online, I think that's a great way to get people introduced. But the goal of knowledge and understanding is kind of that interpersonal connection with someone like a professor or someone who has uh, just a better knowledge than you to be able to have that interpersonal connection, communication, and debate over yeah. ideas. Uh, Cedarville recently just, uh, so you're required to have a Bible minor at Cedarville, mm -hmm. and they recently released the entire Bible minor online for free. So if That's students cool. of parents or parents of students and uh, other people want to know about Cedarville, their stances, and how mm -hmm. they teach the Bible, they can go on and learn it from there. I recommend, <laughs> like, if you're going to be a Cedarville student, don't take any Bible classes online. I took the first Bible class online because I didn't know if I was going to go to a Christian school or not. Yeah. I took it back in my junior year of high school. Um, so I wouldn't have done that if I knew I was going to Cedarville then. But if you have any idea of going to a Christian school, I would push off all the Bible classes or just take them again. 
yeah. uh, learn from a Bible professor who knows what they're talking about. Like there are some amazing Bible profs here at Cedarville, and mm-hmm. I definitely believe there's great ones at Liberty. So I think uh, the biblical integration in the coursework as well, like economics, there's so much yeah. you're like, oh, that's just like economics business. There's no biblical integration. There. There's <laughs> yeah. a lot of biblical integration in every single thing and every single major. And it's really cool to hear about it from the professors, our dean of the Plaster School of Business, really. I sat in one of his classes, um, I was filming some stuff, and I was just like, this feels almost like a biblical lecture on top of learning about economics yeah. and capitalism and what uh, business really does, and it was <laughs> cool to see. So I kind of want to end things here um, to talk about your outlook, like uh, what's next for you? You're leaving school here yeah. in... Uh, May is it? Is that when graduation yes, sir. is? May. Nice. So, what do you have lined up after school? What are your plans for the <laughs> next year? Um, yeah, what's going That's on? The uh, ultimate question a senior dreads to hear, man. You're yeah. gonna you're face that in a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, but it's been weird because I've been in school for years, right? Like I, yeah. I've had a choice. You know, when it came to coming to Liberty, I could choose, but I knew I was gonna go to college since I was little. So, you know, this is kind of the first time that it's a big question, like what's next. Uh, again, with kind of my transition from a passion for politics to a passion for leadership, uh, really my, again, my two passions at this point are organizational leadership, managing, like managing and ordering teams well, um, and spiritual formation and like renovation of the heart. Politics is great, but really all it can do, all it's God given limits are to affect our behavior. It can't really change the motivation of the heart. And my heart is to like form a different kind of people who then have the character and the heart and the love to be able to fulfill the demands of politics. So with those things in mind, I think I'm kind of really retracing an idea of what my career and vision for the future is going to look like. Um, it's funny. Once you go up in college, I started with like a 10 year, 20 year plan, you know, laying out like exactly what I wanted my policy career to look like. And now I'm here and I don't even know what I'm doing next year, which is funny how that works, but I don't think it's a bad thing. Like it's not like I'm not ambitious, but the Lord has just reordered my ambitions to make them higher and for him. Uh, so in terms of next year, uh, I'm going to be staying here in Lynchburg because I just got engaged. So staying here, uh, learning how to be an adult in a college town, which will be a little interesting. But I have a couple interviews with Jobs for Liberty. I just said, hey, I want to work under a great leader. So send me some great leaders and I'd love to be their assistant. So have a couple interviews there. And then I also have um, some opportunities opening up uh, remote to work kind of in policy jobs, uh, especially in the immigration side. That's a topic I'm passionate about. So Maybe I'll, I'll work for one of those organizations. Um, I'd love to work for a solid leader for a year or two. And then once Claire graduates and we get married next summer, um, we'll go from there. I would love to end up being something like maybe an executive pastor because that could combine my my heart for uh, kind of executive leadership and discipleship at the same time. Uh, I've also thought about being a professor of theology and ethics, public theology. Uh, how do we apply faith to our politics? Um, or even a college administrator, like a dean, or I would love to be a college president or something like that, provost. So a lot of options, yeah. uh, but I'm excited for what the Lord has next. Yeah, it's exciting. I think um, it's not a bad thing to have like a five-year plan or whatever. Um, having some goals are good to yeah. set, but really <laughs> having that open door of like, God, where are you going to take me in this time? What are you going to do with me next? What's the next step? And uh, I think um, having that in my life, too, it's really nice to know, mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, I kind of know what's going to happen in the next three years. I'm going to be at college, yeah. hopefully. So what what's next after that? I don't have anything I'm set on. So it's like, yeah. here, here it is. It's an open door. You're not going to have to pry me away from anything because God's mm-hmm. going to do what he is in his plan regardless of what's in your mind. Yep. So having an open mind to start just makes it a little bit easier of a process. Mm-hmm. And so. if we're too focused on our future, I can fall prey to this. If we're too focused on our future, we're going to miss everything that the Lord has for us in the moment. Yeah. Like all that the Lord has promised us is today. Uh, in Hebrews 4, he even talks about that with the Sabbath. Like he says, I, I still want to practice Sabbath. Like I think it's an important thing. But in Hebrews 4, the author says like, hey, like the Lord has given you rest today. And I think he's also given us vision and purpose today. Uh, so often it's easy to get caught up, especially as ambitious college students in our next career, our next opportunity, and just keep our eyes on the future, which is important. Of course, we want to be rightly ambitious. 
Um, but at the same time, we cannot miss the gifts that the Lord has given us now. So that the people in front of us, uh, the job that we have right now, uh, as Christians, we shouldn't just look for a job or the job that we're in as a way to jump to the next opportunity. But how is the Lord forming us personally, professionally, spiritually in this job right now? And how can I make this job better and do it to the best of my ability? And if we if we do focus on the present in the best sort of way, caring about the people around us, working like crazy uh, to fulfill our current responsibilities, the Lord will reward that. And then he will both form us into the kind of person we need to be to take on the responsibilities that he's going to give us, which that is so humbling because then that's not on us, man. Like, I'm sure you've had experiences like that before, even with running for VP, where it's not really your own idea. Like I got asked to run for speaker when I did not see that in my future. And then I had a vision for student body president, but I also got asked to run. And so the Lord orchestrates circumstances in ways that we have no idea. Um, you know, we can, we can make plans, but the Lord orders our steps, as scripture says. So again, make your five-year plan, but give it to the Lord. Yeah, you have to give it to him because he will yeah. form it to however he needs in his plan that he has for you. So, Daniel, I think our time has come up. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you for your time again, um, just to hear all the exciting things going on at Liberty and your life and uh, your involvement with SGA. Uh, do you have any final uh, words of encouragement, announcements, where people can find you yeah. um, before we have to sign off? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, if you want to get in touch, get coffee, talk online about leadership, spiritual formation, anything else you're passionate about, books you're reading, um, just shoot me an email, dhostetter1 at liberty.edu, or check out my Instagram. I like to post what I'm reading and uh, what I'm keeping up with there. Um, I'm cu currently am reading uh, Slow Productivity by Cal Newport, so that's my read of the moment. Um, big audiobook guy currently while I work out or um, hold laundry or whatever. So, uh, I love reading and uh, encourage you all to read. But Will, you too, man. I'm proud of you. Uh, the work you're doing at Cedarville is legit. I've been keeping up over social media, and I'm really proud of this podcast. I think you're producing not only interesting content, but worthwhile content. Uh, in our digital age, there's so much just information uh, that we really need authorities and people who can speak well um, into ordering our public life. And I think you're one of the men for this moment. So keep it up, and uh, best of luck on your on your run. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the words of encouragement. Everyone, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful and you just got some good words of wisdom and uh, some information from Daniel. Uh, please check out everything. It'll be down in the description. Uh, subscribe, like, and we'll see you another time. God bless. See you later. And